Welcome to Space News from the Electric Universe, brought to you by the Thunderbolts Project at thunderbolts.info. NASA's New Horizons mission has recently shared pictures of the most distant object in our solar system ever imaged by a spacecraft. It's nicknamed Ultima Thule, a relatively tiny body, just 19 miles long, located more than 4 billion miles from Earth in the so-called Kuiper Belt. As we can see, like countless asteroids, some moons, as well as the majority of comet nuclei imaged to date, Ultima Thule is made of two distinct lobes which are joined by a thin neck region. Unsurprisingly, the only process by which planetary scientists can imagine the object forming is a collision between two bodies, both of which had accreted in the solar system's conjectured infancy, supposedly more than 4 billion years ago. However, for over seven years on this series, we have outlined the amazing failures, both experimental and observational, of the gravitational accretion hypothesis to explain objects in our solar system and the universe beyond it. This crisis is outlined in a 2018 news report, which states, According to the traditional story of the origin of the solar system, the planets form slowly from accretion as particles in the circumstellar disk clump together to great pebbles, then slightly larger spheres, on and on until they reach their current size. But when scientists try to recreate this story with computer models, it breaks down. Rather than growing, these incipient planets tend to splinter after reaching pebble size. Based on the abundance of small, double-lobed objects in our solar system, it would seem, according to astronomers, that collisions between these bodies have not been particularly rare, but have been relatively commonplace in our solar system's history. These objects have routinely floated together and then fused, incredibly sometimes forming a neck region in the process. In the case of the comet 67P, Rosetta mission scientists had favored the speculation that such a low-speed collision between two comets had created the double-lobe nucleus. But more recently, a team of scientists acknowledged that 67P does not appear to be billions of years old. They performed simulations to try to prove that a mere millions of years ago, two comets were destroyed in a high-velocity collision and then re-coalesced rather than dispersing in the vacuum of space, as depicted in the computer animation on your screen. In contrast, the Electric Universe has always proposed that comets, asteroids, and meteoroids did not form from accretion billions of years ago. Rather, they were recently torn from planetary surfaces by interplanetary electrical discharge. In fact, as we have shown dozens of times, the double-lobed form is easily reproduced in experiments with electrical discharge, creating a stunning analog for countless celestial objects. Today, physicist Wal Thornhill explains why Ultima Thule appears to be yet another resounding victory for the Electric Universe theory. NASA and the Space Age is the gift that keeps on giving. This last week we've had the New Horizon spacecraft arriving at a tiny body in the so-called Kuiper Belt, in the outer reaches of the solar system. The nickname given by NASA scientists to the object is Ultima Thule, in classical and medieval literature, a name given to a distant unknown region, the extreme limit of travel and discovery. Ultima Thule is a Kuiper Belt object, or KBO, also known more specifically as a trans-Neptunian object, or TNO, since the Kuiper Belt occupies an enormous donut-shaped volume in the cold outer reaches of our solar system, beyond the orbit of Neptune. The New Horizon spacecraft is sampling this region from the orbit of Neptune at 30 AU out to a distance of 50 AU. According to the nebula hypothesis of formation of the solar system, astronomers believe there are millions of small icy leftover objects out there, including hundreds of thousands that are larger than 60 miles or 100 kilometres wide. Some, including Pluto, are over 600 miles, or 1,000 kilometres wide. When the first pixelated image of Ultima Thule arrived showing an elongated object, I wrote, This discovery, based on the double-lobed appearance, fits perfectly with the Electric Universe scenario. 
See, for example, my recent YouTube Space News on Seeing Double. Close-up images should probably show a non-icy, rocky appearance like Comet 67P. A NASA website tells us a fairly large number of Kuiper Belt objects or KBOs either have moons, that is, significantly smaller bodies that orbit them, or are binary objects. Binaries are pairs of objects that are relatively similar in size or mass that orbit around a shared center of mass that lies between them. Some binaries actually touch, creating a sort of peanut shape, creating what's known as a contact binary. Pluto and other minor planets, Eris, Haumea and Quiwa are all Kuiper Belt objects that have moons. Formation by gravitational accretion didn't predict a double-lobed shape for planetesimals, asteroids or comets. In fact, it has difficulty in keeping small colliding particles together without some form of stickiness or electrostatic clinginess. Then there's a problem removing angular momentum from closely orbiting bodies. It requires a number of smaller objects to be slung out of the system to remove the excess momentum. But we run into a problem that was identified by the astronomer Tom Van Flanden. He said, The most difficult objection for the gravitational condensation theory is to overcome how such objects could form in the first place. The mean distance between small bodies in the vast volume of the Kuiper belt is so great that collision and accretion has negligible probability. So the leftmost image from NASA JPL is fanciful, to say the least. Then there's the problem of attaching and forming a neck between two bodies. The impact was proposed in the NASA TV presentation as equivalent to a bump in a car parking lot. But that doesn't explain the neck. Ice can be treated as rock at the very low temperatures at that distance from the sun. And rocks don't fuse together when they collide at low speed. More significantly, why do we only ever see two objects fused together? In later, more detailed images, it seems Ultima Thule has significant cratering, which implies many high-speed collisions between objects in the Kuiper Belt, despite the fact that they should be orbiting the Sun with low relative velocities and an infinitesimal probability of collision. Given their vanishingly small cross-section in the unimaginable immensity of Kuiper Belt space, NASA's story only survives because diagrams like that shown give a false impression. But that's not all. Gravitational accretion is a hypothesis, not a fact. Calling rings of material around distant stars accretion disks is merely an assumption. We routinely see stars ejecting matter, yet it is never considered that such disks may be equatorial ejection disks, like a mega-coronal mass ejection. Such is the mesmerizing power of a paradigm, a story told over and over so the brain goes into neutral. And it is remarkable how the disciplined minds shut out or quickly forget discordant data. For example, here is one discovery that shows there is not enough material in nebula disks to make planets, let alone minor planets at vast distances from the star. Only last October, Quantum magazine published an article, Planets Found to be Larger Than the Disks They Come From. It reads, A new research paper suggests that planets may be forming in ways beyond our understanding. In system after system, planets are much larger than the universe's biggest star skirts. This seems to defy math, or at least reason. Planets shouldn't be larger than the stuff they're made from. Of course, this defies understanding because the model is wrong. Powerful, long-range electromagnetic forces form all condensed objects in the universe. Gravity has nothing to do with it. Only after the electromagnetic forces have subsided does gravity, the weakest force in the universe, take over to produce orbital systems. Galaxies are star birth engines and they show the electromagnetic forces in action. That's why gravitational theory doesn't work for them. Modified gravity, black holes and dark matter are unnecessary fictions once this simple fact is understood. We can stop spending billions chasing imaginary particles and objects in deep space. 
Plasma cosmologists have known the answer for half a century, but the crabbed spirit of specialism has denied astronomers this understanding. Science, as it is practiced today, is dysfunctional. The alignment of spiral galaxies, like Catherine wheels strung along a wire, and their common rate of rotation, regardless of size, is all simply explained if the wire happens to be in the form of galactic scale rotating Birkel and current filament pairs. Birkel and currents are formed by two parallel current filaments which attract each other according to Ampere's law. As they draw closer, the magnetic attraction between them is overcome by electrostatic repulsion caused by charge separation within those filaments. As a result, those filaments circle about each other to form a twisted pair, a configuration well known to electrical engineers. And it is this pairing that tends to concentrate matter in toroids and closely orbiting bodies. The galactic toroid gives rise to the observed peanut cross-section of the central galactic bulge in spiral galaxies. Plasma behaviour is scalable over an enormous range, from the galactic down to the laboratory on Earth, where this has been tested. So the process that forms stars and galaxies also forms planets and smaller satellites in the same process. That process has been seen by infrared telescopes to produce stars in pairs, like beads on a necklace along interstellar Birkeland currents inside molecular clouds. At present, smaller bodies like planets can't be detected in molecular clouds by our infrared telescopes. So what evidence do we have for the formation of planets in pairs? There was a report from the Keck Observatory in January last year titled Planets Around Other Stars Are Like Peas in a Pod. It reads, The team found that exoplanets tend to be the same sizes as their neighbours. If one planet is small, the next planet around that same star is very likely to be small as well. And if one planet is big, the next is likely to be big. They also found the planets orbiting the same star tend to have a regular orbital spacing. So it is very interesting that the astronomer Tom Van Flanden drew attention to the possibility that Jupiter and Saturn can be considered as twins. Even more so if Saturn ejected a lot of matter recently, leaving the evidence behind in that planet's ephemeral rings. Also, Uranus and Neptune make a pair with similar masses, compositions and solar distances. Each pair is notably dissimilar to its adjoining pair or pairs. Now, there is no particular reason under the primeval solar nebula hypothesis of planetary formation why this should be so. The nebula from which the planets allegedly condensed should have been rather homogeneous in most respects, and planet masses should have had a smooth radial gradient with solar distance. Sometimes, in moments of lucidity, science writers state the obvious. Richard Kerr in the Science Journal in 1999 addressed this issue. The four terrestrial planets nestled closely to the life-giving sun make an unlikely family. Little moon-like Mercury is mostly iron, covered with a bit of rock and has no atmosphere. Venus, Earth's twin in size and composition, is smothered by a most unearth-like inferno of an atmosphere and is drier than any desert. On Earth, which is nearly drowning in water, continents drift across a surface infected in every crack and crevice by life. And Mars, a tenth the mass of Earth, has an ancient immobile face, now dry and lifeless but with hints of an earlier, more hospitable era. A single family? more like a bunch of unrelated adoptees from alien planetary systems. The centuries-old nebula accretion model is long overdue for retirement, yet every space mission is launched with the benediction that it will show us how the solar system was formed. It can do that, but not while reciting the nebula hypothesis as a fact. It has been discredited again and again during the space age, but all that happens is the computer models are adjusted to provide the virtual reality which passes for science in this unenlightened age. So far, observers have catalogued over 2,000 trans-Neptunian objects. Importantly, those objects are not evenly distributed through space. Once astronomers started discovering them in the early 1990s, 
One of the early surprises was that they could be grouped according to the shapes and sizes of their orbits. This led scientists to understand that there are several distinct groupings or populations of these objects, whose orbits provide clues about their history. The expectation was that if there were objects beyond Neptune, they would be in relatively circular orbits that aren't tilted too much from the plane of the planets. Instead, many KBOs are found to belong to families, some with significantly elliptical and tilted orbits, and associations with the planet Neptune. Pluto's orbit is in a stable, repeating pattern with Neptune's. For every three orbits completed by Neptune, Pluto makes two orbits. These features suggest capture episodes, rather than leftovers of a primordial nebula. Dr. John Hewitt wrote in his report to the Royal Society, A Habit of Lies, To be of any real value, a new idea must compete with existing suppositions used to explain the same data set. It is diametrically wrong to demand of a new hypothesis that it be consistent with the ideas it sets out to replace. The electric universe is a distinctly new hypothesis. It uses forensic evidence from the entire span of man's experience of the sky to replace the old theoretical belief in the orderly nebula hypothesis that the planets orbit now roughly where they were formed primordially. This idea is centuries old and formed the basis of the uniformity principle, beloved of mathematicians because they believe they can feed in the movements of the planets today and announce where the planets were thousands or even millions of years ago. This has allowed scientists to propose gradual evolution and climate cycles based on slight wobbles of the Earth. It is merely wishful thinking. The geological record shows otherwise, with clear evidence of paroxysms of extreme violence. The solar system has a recent dramatic history, which we will only begin to understand when we give up the nebula hypothesis and look for family resemblances instead, because the Sun has a blended family. As Tobias Owen of the University of Hawaii recommended in considering random events in shaping the solar system, it behooves planetary scientists to decipher the patterns, looking for the ties that unite even the most dissimilar siblings into a single family. Only then may we understand Ultima Thule, and that knowledge will change everything.